Hey everybody, good afternoon and, uh, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon and thank you for your loyal support to Robin Hood as Forest members. Um, if you are new to the Forest and you're here to, uh, to check it out for the first time, uh, welcome. And, uh, and we're excited to have you as a member of, we're excited to have you as a member of the Forest. Uh, for those who are longtime members of the Forest, we're excited to see you. Uh, we need you, and we hope that you'll continue uh, to come in, continue coming back. Uh, and we know that all of you are here really because you are here to make a difference for our New York City neighbors. Um, and as the forest, as a Robin Hood community, we really are united by a larger shared goal of being able to elevate our mission of being able to fight for economic mobility, to be able to fight for sustainable economic mobility and really exploring the dynamics of poverty and especially through this lens of race. And it's one of the reasons that we're so excited about the Forest Book Club. And I wanna give a huge shout out to the team for not just the ideas and the vision, but really for the execution of this Forest Book Club. Uh, this event marks the inaugural conversation for the book club. And it really is gonna be an event series that we will be having regularly, which is gonna be focusing on topics of economic and racial justice. Uh, I know many of you are gonna be hosting your own individual book clubs uh, after this conversation, but thank you for not just having these discussions with your friends and family, but also doing it with a sense of urgency and doing it with a sense of collective action being the larger part of the goal, uh, because we know that this generation are the ones who are driving change. Uh, we know that when we look at what's happening right now, these are not isolated conversations. These are conversations that the entire country are having about how do we recognize this interplay between economic justice and racial justice? How do we understand the interplay of all the various elements and ways that this shows itself to include housing, which we're going to dig into a little bit later on, uh, a little later on today? And also, but knowing that the first step to be able to do that uh, and to create that change is going to be knowledge. And considering that, there is nobody more appropriate to have this initial conversation start off with than, uh, than uh, a friend of mine and a friend of Robin Hood, uh, Matt Desmond, uh, who is the author of an absolutely remarkable book uh, called Evicted, which really pulled, uh, pulled our nation into a better understanding and pulled a curtain back from understanding how challenging it is for people to be able to survive the damages and the impacts of housing insecurity. Uh, the fact that we have people who every single day, this issue of homelessness and housing insecurity, how real it is, and also how that touches and how it permeates every single aspect of our life. And so uh, I'm absolutely honored to be in conversation today uh, with Matt. Uh, who spoke at Robin Hood's inaugural No City Limits conference uh, and really inspired our entire eviction prevention work, uh, like our first grant to the Furman Center, uh, Just Fixed, and also more. Uh, and he's really inspired in many ways how we think about this work and how we drive it. He's the uh, Maurice P. During Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. Uh, he's the author of four books, uh, including Evicted and also Profit in American City, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, National Book Critics Circle Award, the Carnegie Medal, the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for nonfiction. Uh, he's really one of the most important and prolific writers, thinkers, and also action-oriented uh, uh, providers that we have within our society. Uh, and so we're incredibly thankful and grateful to have him, have him here joining us. Um, before we, I start the conversation with Matt, uh, a few brief housekeeping items. Uh, in the Zoom webinar format, all participants will remain muted. We have collected audience questions in advance uh, to this conversation, and you can use the Q&A chat box to be able to ask us questions directly uh, and, uh, you know, as we get into the, to the larger Q&A portion of this conversation. Uh, again, it is so great to see all of you. I'm incredibly excited to, uh, to get started uh, with this conversation now. Uh, so Matt, first, welcome. Uh, it is Great to see you. And, and, and first, I just want to start with a question just uh, that I, you know, I just really want to lead with. And the first question is, how are you doing in, uh, in this moment? How are you and the family doing? Yeah, I, well, first, Wes, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's always amazing uh, to be connecting with you. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be in conversation with Robin Hood. And thank you so much for all the incredible work you're doing 
to fight poverty and to boost people's opportunities in in the New York City region. So thanks, man. And that's an amazing room, I gotta say. I don't know. If <laughs> it's, it's I'm raider. waiting on my room raider evaluation. You deserve room raider evaluation. That's a ten in my book. Um, <laughs> So, My background's not as nice as yours, though. That's pretty. That's uh, that's that's beautiful. What you got, man? We we've got some trees. We have got some trees going. Um, we're okay. You know, we're okay. I, you know, busy, busy, exhausting. You know, I've got two little ones. I know you've got little ones at home too. Um, so we've been trying to to juggle the the work school balance thing, and then you know the the stress on um, on people facing eviction. Uh, this the um, the policy um, need right now uh, is so acute. And so the team and I have been really working on overdrive, trying to get basic information out there, trying to pull policy levers, trying to push the media narrative a little bit. And um, so it's, it's been really, really busy since March, um, but we're okay. We feel blessed, we feel, we feel lucky and, and privileged to do the work we, we get to do and, and everyone's hanging in there. Good, good. Well yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm good, man. We're good here. And, uh, and I'm really glad to hear it. And you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where you figure and you realize how, how busy things are, how complicated things are. But but the reality is, is that for 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 you and for and for us, thankfully, thank God, you know, the idea of eviction is not something that is on our minds right now, right? It's on it's on our minds of the work. But we're, we're blessed in the idea that that's not something that's sitting on us, but you realize, you know, how many people that is an everyday reality where they are literally looking at a calendar. Right. To be under understand when certain provisions are ending, when certain supports are ending. Um, and it actually goes back to the first question I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, you're an incredibly data-driven person, you know, as, as am I, as, 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 uh, as this organization is. But you did a beautiful job of humanizing what it was like for individuals and for families where this is not just something that's on their mind, oftentimes it's front of mind uh, and it's coloring every decision that they're making throughout the day. Uh, in Evicted, you, you follow these eight families um, yeah. you know, through, the, through the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and it was a really brilliant way of being able to tell a larger story. Can you talk to us about your process how you went about selecting these individuals that you were going to follow and, and, and why was that important for that to be the mechanism to take us on this journey? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it was important because that's, who I, that's, that's where I learned the most. I learned the most from the people that invited me into their lives. You know, I, you know, I spent time with a young woman named Crystal in the book. You know, she was 18. She just aged out of foster care and she would do things that were confusing to me. You know, she seemed to th take life a bit lightly when I think she should have taken it heavier. And the more I spent time with Crystal, I realized like, oh, she can't. Like if, like poverty is like one thing after another, after another, after another. And if she took them all like with utter seriousness, she would go crazy. You know, she taught me that, you know, I, I spent time um, with a guy named Scott, you know, who was struggling with a heroin addiction. And watched him try to try to get clean and one you know we we woke up one morning and um like at dawn like four something in the morning and we drove to the county rehab and we we opened the elevator the elevator opened up and and you just see this line of people this line of people bunch of ages diverse group just waiting uh waiting for the count that's how many people they let into rehab that day you know and scott takes a seat he's maybe 50th in line you know um, and, uh, I learned a lot more from being in those kind of situations, you know, that they teach you something different. And so I thought that the people that let me into their lives should be center stage in the book. They shouldn't be a vignette. Um, they shouldn't be something uh, illuminating a larger point. They should be the point and that the data have to kind of fit around them. Mm. Um, and then, you know, with respect to the process, I, you know, I was, uh, I was living in Wisconsin and I knew I wanted to write a, a Milwaukee book. Um, and um, so I moved to Milwaukee and then I was like, okay, how do I, how do I find families getting evicted? And one day the local paper, the journal Sentinel ran a story about a, a landlord of a mobile home park who might be losing his license 
because they have so many code violations. That would like result in a mass eviction. So I drove down there and I was like, can I rent one of your, your trailers? He's like, absolutely. And so that's, that's how I moved into the trailer home. And he kept his trailer park, but uh, there are all sorts of normal evictions going on there. And that's how I met Scott. And that's how I met Lorraine. And that's how I met Pam and Ned. And, um, and then I knew I needed to capture the experiences of African-American renters. I needed to move to the north side of Milwaukee. Milwaukee's so segregated, as you know. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and the trailer park was on the south side. And so there was an African-American security guard working um, as part of the negotiation with the, the mobile homeowner yeah. uh, to keep his license. And his name was Officer Wu. And I said, Officer Wu, I'd like to move into your neighborhood. And he said, do you, do you mean by Marquette, like Marquette University downtown? And I said, no, like your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And he said, do you mean like on the east side, you know, which is kind of the hip up and coming. And this conversation took a few days, took a few days. <laughs> and then finally, when, when I was like, no, like in your neighborhood, like, could we be roommates? He was like, oh, okay. And we were roommates. I, I, I moved in with him. Mm -hmm. And then his landlord was Sharina, who was the main landlord that I profiled on, on the north side. And that's kind of how it started there. You know, and, and it's, it's uh, I think one of the things that's so fascinating, even about this idea of character selection, um, it's this idea that, you know, you were probably one of the first people that actually approached many of the people who you profiled and actually wanted to do a deep dive, which I'm sure for them was, was complicated because there is this idea of like, why does this person want to spend so much time with me? Because we're talking about people who oftentimes are, comp are forgotten within our society. And I feel like that was part of the point that you were making within this, this, these stories. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, my first book event was in, in Milwaukee and Arlene, uh, who was a single mom um, that I met on the North side, she came with me and my wife to our, the very first book event. And um, she was so confused when people showed up. She was like, why do these people care about my story? And one of the things that um, has been special, I think, as more people have engaged with the book is, you know, be given a talk in Houston or Baton Rouge or something and people will come up to you and they'll say, how's Arlene? How's she doing? You know, and, you know, how's Vanetta? Uh, what happened to her? And I, I'll call Arlene like after the talk and I'll say, someone asked about you today. And that, that means a ton to Arlene and a ton to Vanetta. And, um, and that people care not just about the issue, but about them as people, you know, their families. And so uh, when I wrote the book, I always had these three audiences in mind. I, I had the, the reading public. I wanted to move policymakers and academics, but I had these eight people in mind, right? These families, like I wanted them to be able to be proud of this and feel like I did them justice. And so, um, so now Arlene will go, she'll like go into a library sometimes and go up to a librarian and she, she'll be like, you know, have you read this book? And if the librarian says, yeah, she's like, I'm our lead. And it's like, what? And so, um, and that makes me proud that like people, you know, carry their stories like that. It's hard to read your story because it's not, you know, it's not all um, flattering, right? And, um, and so I, um, I also take this incredible amount of heart by how courageous people were letting me write their story. I remember, you know, all the folks in the book read the book before anyone else did. They read it in men, you know, like, you know, right before I went to press, I gave everyone a, um, every single page that they were in. And we went over it or I read it to them. And I remember reading Crystal, her story to her um, in this little restaurant. Uh, um, and, um, and, you know, her story is a really tough place. You know, this is a church going woman and she, kind of burns a lot of bridges, she descends into street homelessness and even has to turn to prostitution. So I was just reading, reading, reading this to her and I stopped and I looked up and she just, it was, she paused and she said, uh, you know, um, uh, I knew a lot of personal stuff would be in there, but that's how it was. You know, and that just takes so much guts from her, right? So much courage. Um, yeah, it, um, it, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of, courage and also it get, but it gave us an opportunity to kind of see how these evolutions take place it gave us an opportunity where you see that in some cases this was a generational conversation 
and in some cases how fragile that line is that even once a person feels like they're starting to gain a little bit of momentum how that momentum can be stunted and stunted in a way that they had nothing to do with or not responsible for uh and, and particularly in the issue of housing um you see how it shows itself i, I want to you, you you do something that i think was really important too was you show how you know even though this issue of housing insecurity is something that crosses racial lines that crosses uh you know that, that crosses the different you know uh in, environmental and background dynamics um but you were also very clear about you know about the the deep the deep racial disparities even when you look at different parts of milwaukee um and where you also see that that along with other cities such as cleveland and baltimore st louis are this 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 confluence of hyper segregation and deep poverty and how oftentimes those things completely exist together. And so we're witnessing this level of, of deep racial disparities with COVID-19 that have been exposed and exacerbated. Uh, but can you also talk a little bit about the racial complexities of housing instability? You know, how have people of color in particular, uh, Black and, and Latinx people been impacted by evictions? How do you think that the racial composition of those most impacted by the evictions, uh, you know, how, how do you see those continuing to change and evolve and specifically kind of, you know, over this 10 year period from the time, you know, of, 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 you know, of doing research and now what we're seeing right now. Right, yeah. So um, sometimes when we talk about eviction and housing displacement, uh, gentrification is the kind of the frame we use, right? We say these, these neighborhoods are changing, there's a lot of turnover and kind of stable communities and often stable black and Latinx communities are being replaced by more affluent, often wider communities. And that's an important story. That's an incredibly important story. But if you really study the data and, and if you live in neighborhoods that are deeply affected by eviction, you know that's not the story. Yeah. The story is racism. That's the story. And most evictions happen in poor, segregated, Black and Latino communities, where even there, uh, folks can't um, afford a roof over their head. And so this is a pattern I saw in Milwaukee. You know, Milwaukee citywide eviction rate is about one in 30 renter homes. But if you go on the north side, if you go to the African-American neighborhoods, that rate's about one in 14. So that means you walk down a street and look to your left and look to your right, and one apartment on each side is going to be gone by the end of the year, right? Mm -hmm. That's this level of churn, this level of, of threat. And so for the last several years, I've been collecting like millions and millions of eviction records, right? Like 80 million eviction records. And what we've learned is Milwaukee is not unique at, at all. About one in 40 Americans, uh, renters, get evicted every year. But for African Americans, it's one in 25. And that's, that's a disparity that reflects the systematic dispossession of Black families and Latino families from the land, right? And one way to read the history of African Americans in America is to read uh, uh, this over and over again, from slavery to sharecropping to the Great Migration, the ghettoization, to legal segregation, to, to white flight, even up to the financial crisis, right? Where we know that predatory lenders were targeting African American and Latino communities on purpose. And that gets you to this place, right? Where most white families in America own their home. Most white families are homeowners, but most black and most Latino families are renters. And so they're disproportionately exposed uh, to eviction and all its, all its scourges, you know. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I think about the data that, that we have. So we, have, as you know, we have a, a partnership with Columbia University for something called the Poverty Tracker, where it really is allowed to, um, to look at a longitudinal data set of about, you know, 4,000, uh, you know, households uh, in, in, in poverty and being able to look at trends that we're able to see. And, and the Poverty Tracker study, uh, and this was prior to COVID-19, you know, showed that we had a major housing crisis in New York City well before the yeah. pandemic, about, you know, 64,000 homeless New Yorkers, 100,000 people evicted every single year. So a major crisis prior to COVID-19. And so with city unemployment at its highest level in, in more than 40 years now at this point, and frankly, the pathways to for reemployment becoming incredibly complicated, particularly when you're looking at the segments and the sectors in which those jobs were lost. Uh, how is the pandemic intensifying 
this housing project or this housing crisis? And, and what are the measures that you think that we should be considering and thinking about when it comes to trying to stem it in a way that we're seeing this thing explode uh, right in front of our eyes? Right. And so like in a, in a typical year in America, like in a 5% unemployment year in America, um, there are 3.7 million evictions filed. So that's like 800,000 people a month. Yeah. Uh, that's like, you know, being threatened with eviction. That's like the population of Seattle every month being threatened with displacement. That's before March, yeah. right? That's before 14% unemployment, 16% unemployment. That's before economic indicators uh, that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. Right. And so on the one hand, it's incredibly, it's an incredibly scary situation where you have a lot of families that can't pay the rent. You have limited intervention by the federal government. You know, the stimulus check was $1,200. Uh, median rent in the United States now is $1,002, <laughs> right? So if you're living just in a normal apartment, $1,200 gets, gets you nowhere. That's right. Um, and so, and on top of that, we have this mandate, right? Which is, if you want to stay safe, stay in your home. And so, on top of all that, we have still a lot of intellectual capture by property owners that see eviction as a solution. Mm -hmm. And right now, and always, eviction is not a solution. You know, eviction is only something that has spread more poverty, more death, and it's not going to so solve that that property owner's um, problem. You know, and so the other thing that happened though during COVID is it accentuated and uplifted voices of tenant organizers who have been working like crazy since 2008, especially. And, you know, um, you'll remember, right, before uh, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the biggest thing going on on the ground was the rent strike, was organizers kind of calling for rent cancellation all around the country. And I think that they understood that uh, normal wasn't okay. You know, and just fixing the problem, just reverting back to what it was, is reverting back to a situation where the population of Seattle is threatened with homelessness every month. And so I think that that's hopeful, you know, and I think that's encouraging. And I think that we haven't seen this level of renter mobilization since the Great Depression. And so, so, so and, but let me, let me, let me uh, actually come back on, on that. So, because we are seeing a lot of the calls for things like, you know, for, for canceling rent and, you know, right. as a supporter of many of the nonprofit landlords, uh, right. you know, who house vulnerable New Yorkers, you know, we know that, that the problem is, 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 is large. Uh, and, you know, even on this idea of canceling rent, that there is going to be, that there are even limitations when you consider the size of the problem, right? Yeah. What are the pros and the cons? Of these sorts of, of of these sorts of movements and the movements, particularly around the canceling of of rent, whether for a restricted period of time or for a longer period of time. So the organizers that I've spoken to that are calling for rent cancellation are making a point about scale that I think is incredibly important. It is, and you know, this is they're saying, look, we we want rent relief. Yes, we need rent relief from the federal government. But we don't want that to cover 20% of us, 50% of us. We need all of us covered. And that's, that's an interesting dynamic that we see play out on the ground level. New York City saw it with the right to counsel, right? So you have this incredible grassroots mobilization from CASA in the South Bronx, right? This is mainly a, a organization led by Latino and African-American renters. And they're pushing the city for the right to counsel and eviction court. It does not exist in America. Right? They're saying, we want a lawyer if we're threatened with homelessness. They're pushing, 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 pushing. The Blasio responds and says, okay, here's a significant investment in legal aid, right? We're gonna, we're gonna pump a lot more money to legal aid. The organizers say, no thanks, right? No thanks. We, we, we don't want attorney coverage to go from 5% to 20% or to 30%. We want it to go to 100%. You know, and, and they got it, right? And they won it, and they won that right. And so I think that's a similar dynamic playing out on the ground level now. Mm. The pros, right, is this idea of questioning the status quo about is the, is the status quo working for a lot of renters? And if you look at the, 
the rent burdens and you look at the level of evictions, I don't think we can answer yes with a straight face. Um, the, the challenge is, is feasibility and scale, right? The challenge is, and especially, you know, especially cities like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Albuquerque, New Mexico, one in 21 renter homes are evicted in Albuquerque every year. You know, these are places that don't have these- One in 21. Right. It's, it's huge. And so these are places that don't have this strong history of tenant mobilization. Mm. And, um, and so could we get something, um, you know, uh, could, could cancel the rent scale um, to, the, to, to cover everyone in the United States? I think that's a challenge. A lot of organizers are kind of like, they're not focused on that challenge, right? They're focused on their city and kind of calling for, for a new status quo. So um, I, I'm listening. I'm doing a lot of listening. I'm doing a lot of, of, of writing about this. And I think, you know, what we saw, when we saw this happen, sorry to, sorry to can I just, uh, just one more thing on this? Like, Please, no, this is, this is great. Please. So when we saw this, so the last time this happened in mass was during the Great Depression, right? And there were eviction blockades. Uh, people physically fought with marshals doing evictions, like the sticks. Like the New York Times coverage of this has these crazy like uh, passages about like people throwing bottles and sticks. There's a passage I read in a story saying like the women were the most, most militant, you know, these women coming out and like, you know, it was a real street fight. It was a street fight, a street battle. What came out of that? Literally, our public housing system came out of that, right? Like, literally public housing hmm. and, and rent, rent control or rent stabilization, which at its height covered over 200 cities in America. Now, both of those programs have seen certain retrenchments. But what we did see when we, the last time we had real serious levels of tenant mobilization was real concessions uh, from the federal government. And when we're talking about real concessions of the federal government, you know, right now, you know, we're in this position where we're now looking at essentially the COVID relief for uh, right. what's going to be in included. And I know a lot of the conversation around that is it's, it's, it's children and it's schools and it's continued cash assistance and a lot of those other things. Um, but we also know that we have some basic restrictions that are, that are coming up, right? Eviction or moratorium expirations, uh, uh, unemployment benefits, you know, decreases. Uh, we, we know we have some very serious headwinds that are coming up, particularly for the families who these type of covenants have been helping to keep them alive, uh, you know, during, during this period. As we're having the debates around COVID-4, and, and, and this tranche, and particularly considering the fact that the probability of there being a five before election is probably pretty slim. Uh, what are the things that you are hoping that we will consent, uh, uh, consider and include as, we're ha as we know that timelines, moratoriums are coming, are coming short, and as we probably know this will be the, potentially be a last tranche of cash and focus that is going to take place at least for the next, call it four, four or five months until post-election day? So uh, I think there's three, there's three big things. Uh, one is just a national moratorium on evictions. And, you know, we have a national moratorium right now on evictions that receive federal backing. Mm -hmm. you know, that covers about a third of all renters. Right. And the enforcement of those moratoriums still are pretty shaky, you know, like we've done some preliminary analysis in Houston and we found that about 7% of evictions that are being filed, like in the last several weeks are in direct violation of the CARES Act. Yeah. So we need, we, we, and, and by the way, those moratoriums expire in a few days, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's just, there's just a few days and they're gone. Right. So we need a serious national moratorium on evictions. We need to, realize like housing is healthcare, especially now. And we need to, to protect those families from homelessness and from disease spread. That's one. The second is we need rent relief. You know, we do need uh, those families to be able to pay all these arrears that's been built up. Uh, we need to make sure that um, they are not constantly with the turn of every month living in fear of losing their, their home, especially during a global pandemic. So how much rent relief do we need? So that number has been calculated by the Harbor Joint Center. It's been calculated by the folks at the Furman Center at NYU. It's been calculated by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And the number basically floats between $70 billion and $130 billion. It's, it's serious money. 
we have a serious housing crisis and this, this, this pandemic hit in the middle of that. And so I think that we need rent relief at scale, at scale of the problem. And there's a, there's a lot of consensus that around 100 billion is at scale of the problem. Hmm. And third, we need, we need attorneys, we need legal aid. We need to make sure that if families are put through this incredibly, um, uh, incredibly scary and often uh, violent as exposing them to violence um, process right now that they should have an attorney by their side. They should, they should make sure that um, they have their rights fully executed during this time. And that, you know, the studies on this are, it's, it's completely intuitive. You know, if I was getting evicted, if you were, we would hire an attorney, right? And it, it, it really matters. And so it doesn't have to be antagonistic, although it often is, it could be media, mediation and finding a way to make it work for, for all parties involved. I think those are the three things the federal government can and must do during this next session of Congress. And it's also it's just a basic reinforcement of constitutional right. Right, it, particularly particularly on that on that on that third on, on that third right. em implement, it's not asking for anything special. It's asking for essentially a reinforcement of a constitutional right. Yeah, I mean, like, I've been to eviction courts in Camden and Philly and in, in, in Milwaukee, all over the all over the country. They, they don't look like courts, right? That's right. I mean, they're not places where there's two sides and they're arguing. There's places where tenants are are doing a, a back deal with their their landlord's attorney in the hallway, not really understanding what's going on. There's places where most families don't show up because they know it's just going to be this kind of like degradation ceremony for them. Yeah. You know, and it, it makes more sense. Like it makes more sense for when a family, like when, when a landlord approaches the family said, you should be out by, by Tuesday or else I'm going to evict you formally. It makes more sense for that family just to go right in most cities. Yeah. And if it makes more sense for a family to like, just, pass on their constitutional rights or just pass on their their the rights they have in a city that that's to tell us that it's fundamentally busted yeah let me um let me actually drill down uh because when people talk about the consequences of eviction you know uh, that actually means a lot and i think for 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 a lot of people they think you know it's important that people understand the full implications of what of what exactly we're talking about here. So can you talk a little bit about the long term implications of the devastation of eviction. Uh, what that does to individuals, families, communities, uh, because you know oftentimes we can talk about policies but forget about the actual impact on the individual when we, when we see that happen. Right. So eviction. Um it causes loss. So f fundamentally, you lose your home, but often families lose their stuff, their possessions, which are piled on the street and often kind of scavenged by neighbors or taken by movers and locked up uh, and, and, and often thrown in the dump. I, I spent a lot of time with the biggest eviction mover in Milwaukee. They told me like seven out of 10 homes that they evict and like take their stuff and they just throw it away, they just throw it in the dump. Mm. and um, a tour in their warehouses and if you tour their warehouses what you just see is like pallet upon pallet of kid stuff you know just cribs and rockers and all this stuff it takes a good amount of money to build a home up an eviction can just delete that right you lose your connection with your neighborhood you lose your connection with your school so kids are bounced from school to school they don't have a chance to form a relationship with that one guidance counselor that's going to invest in them or that one teacher that's looking out for them if you go through the court system, eviction comes with this blemish, this mark, right? So you're carrying that mark around. And when you look for other housing, a lot of landlords will see that and they say, no, no thanks. Because from a landlord's point of view, an eviction's a big deal. Hmm. That's why studies show that families move into worse neighborhoods and in worse housing than they do before. These are neighborhoods with higher levels of crime and violence. This is housing with higher levels of problems. Some people that are like fresh to eviction, they say, well, the family was living in a place they couldn't afford anyways, right? So this is kind of like a market correction. That's not how it works at all. That's right. Like families are living in places they can't afford already at the very bottom of the market, you know? And so they don't pay less in their new place. They often pay a little bit more. That mark of eviction can bar you from public housing because many of our public housing authorities, even though there's no law that says they have to do this, they count eviction as a mark against your application. 
So we're systematically denying housing help to the people that need it the most. Mm. There are studies that show that eviction causes job loss. And if any of you listening have been evicted, you know exactly why that is. It's such a consuming, stressful event. It causes you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market. And then there's the effect, the effect that eviction has on your soul. And when you spend time with people that have been evicted, you see this. You know, I remember this one woman in the book, Patrice Hingston, was like, I feel like I'm stuck in the mud. You see, you, you see people slowing down. You see people's energy and happiness and joy getting sucked out. You know, we have a study that showed that moms who get evicted experience higher rates of depression two years later, two years after the event. So you add all that up and like the conclusion is eviction isn't just a condition of poverty. It's a cause of poverty. It's making mm-hmm. things worse and it's leaving a deep and jagged scar in the next generation because the face of our eviction epidemic is moms with kids. Yeah. And, you know, and when we talk about this idea of the cause of poverty, uh, you, you, you brilliantly just, uh, you know, allude to the fact that it's the psychological damage that it does to the individual. Uh, the break of confidence, but also, you know, it's everything from, especially if it's a family, it's the connection to the school. It's the connection to the other services around the community centers. It's connections to the homes of worship. It's the, this constant, this constant insecurity and fluidity right. of life makes anything else and the stickiness of everything else remarkably complicated. You know, we, we have a, you know, if you look at a situation in, in, in New York, uh, you know, alone, and this is just you know, folks on the on the shelter side, right? Prior to COVID nineteen, the fact that you had twenty thousand children every night who were staying in in shelter, uh, you know, you see how the housing issue, housing insecurity, uh, levels of eviction, it will then end up touching on everything. I know with Robin and with our portfolio, but every other dynamic of society that people are, you know, that people have to contend with. Right, and I, you know, it feels like you know. I know this is the issue that I've, you know, been keeping me up and out for the last 10 years, but it's like, it feels like whatever that issue is for us, the lack of affordable housing is somewhere at the root of that issue. Yeah. You know, you care about racial inequality, you have to care about this lack of housing and the fact that like the United States has created like this semi-permanent renter class among Latino and African-American communities. Like, if you care about like crime reduction, and we have studies showing that neighborhoods that have more evictions have more violent crime, and it's like completely makes sense, right? Yeah. It just rips apart the ability of a neighborhood to keep itself safe. Um, you care about healthcare spending, you know, you look at the books of these hospitals and you realize like the top 5% of ER users consume half of the hospital costs. Mm-hmm. And you're like, who are these people? And it's like homeless folks with serious medical conditions. That's who they are. And so I think, you know, over and over again, I think that we can't, um, we can't fundamentally address poverty. We can't spur economic opportunity uh, without stable shelter. Yeah. I want to, um, uh, we're going to open it up to, to some, to uh, audience questions as well. But before I do that, I just have, um, have, uh, have one more question. And it's, it's also when we think about the geographic differences in which we have housing, because oftentimes part of the complication of, of housing policies is the fact that these geographies are just dealing with different types of housing issues, right? The issues that New York is dealing with when it comes to its housing can be different than the issues that Milwaukee um, is, is, is dealing with versus the issues of Baltimore, where Baltimore has you know 19,000 vacant homes right. inside of the area because of the collapse in the population. And so as we're thinking about that, you know, housing in many ways is both a federal issue, but also in many ways, a hyper-local issue. Uh, how do we think about that push-pull between understanding this from a, from a what is needed on a federal side versus how are we engaging on the very local, on the ground side to be able to create something that makes sense for all of our citizens who, uh, who, who are struggling with this? Yeah, that's, that's huge, right? And I think that one thing fundamentally is like, whenever you hear someone running on about, oh, all we need to do is just like, no, you know? And, right. you know, and it kind of drives me crazy in the housing world because there's folks like, okay, we have this huge supply problem, you know, and we just need to build more housing. 
and you're like, well, where do you live? And they're like, I live in San Francisco, right? Or I live in New York. And you're like, right, like that is what you need to do in San Francisco, New York. <laughs> Guess what? You don't need to do that in Baltimore or Milwaukee or Tulsa or Albuquerque or basically like where most families live in America. It's not a supply story. It's another story. Um, and then there's all these puzzles. There's all this, all these puzzles that need more brains on it. Like the eviction rate has been basically stable over the last 15 years. Rents have not. Why? That's crazy. Uh, why are low cost cities the highest evicting cities? Uh, which, like, uh, uh, who's the biggest evictor in Baltimore? Like, we have no idea how to answer that question because all these shell companies and LLCs. So I think that one, one basic, like, take home is just like, this is complicated and it deserves like a complicated national conversation. But on the local level, I think that there's this really there's an interesting tension, right? Because on the one hand, that's absolutely right. Like what Seattle needs, um, Phoenix, Arizona does not, right? Like, you know, and it's, it, you know, this housing crisis can be addressed in a lot of different ways. I've had this privilege, and I'm sure this is like a giant perk of your job too, of like talking to all these people on the ground all over the country, like just being completely inspired by local solutions. You know, like you go to Lawrence, Kansas. I went to Lawrence, Kansas. I met a bunch of Catholic nuns and they were just pissed off about the housing crisis and they got their city to pass a little sales tax. So all the money would go straight into affordable housing initiatives. You know, you go to, you go to Cleveland and you, you go to their community eviction court sponsored by Court Innovation. And you know, it's, it's not an eviction court. It's like the service provider. You know, mm -hmm. it's a place where the judge asks someone, why are you getting evicted? You know, instead of just, do you owe, you know? and addresses problems right there, you know? And so I think that people are already developing all these brilliant local solutions, but we can't let the federal government off the hook. You know, we still need Washington to, to invest significantly in this issue. And, you know, we used to be a country that invested seriously in housing. And, and that started to change. You know, that changed when Ronald Reagan, for example, cut HUD's budget by 60%, 60%. And then we, we kind of blame the idea of public housing when those towers started to crumble, you know, instead of blaming the fact that like, if you jerk the, if you stop the funding hose, any institution's gonna crumble. Mm -hmm. And so I think that figuring out a way to combine serious federal investment with already existing local brilliance is kind of the sweet spot mm -hmm. um, and not letting Washington off the hook. Yeah. Um, we got some great questions that are coming in. Um, uh, I'll, maybe I'll start, I'll start with this, this, the first one here, uh, is, is gentrification inevitable? Is there a right way to manage gentrification? Um, so, so no, it's not inevitable. I, nothing's inevitable. I, I don't think, um, I, I gotta tell you, I don't study gentrification that much. There are all these amazing people that do. Um, if, uh, and, and we can, we can talk about their work or you can email me and I can direct you to, to them. I think that, um, I've, I've always, um, I've always wanted to study, to study poverty and, and kind of be in a situation where, um, my work is trying, trying to be directly in the service of, of the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable in America generally aren't in gentrifying places. Gentrification is relatively rare, actually. It affects, uh, you know, affects few cities across the country in a really deep way. If we care about, like, there are some things about gentrification that are ethically gut-wrenching, right? Like, when families, like, invest in their community, and they work together, and they improve it, and they win things like a subway stop, and then those, cons they can't benefit from those concessions because the market takes over, that is fundamentally wrong, right? Um, and I think that's a problem we should care about. The problem that I've been focused on for the last 10 years is like, how can we stop the eviction crisis and, and put a stop on homelessness? And that problem touches on eviction, but it really gets you, gets you into places like West Baltimore yeah. or North Milwaukee or, uh, or West Side Chicago, where uh, it doesn't look like gentrification. It looks like, like concentrated poverty. Mm. Um, but I mean, I mean, Wes, you must have this, this great perspective on gentrification too in Baltimore because, you know, one thing that you see in Baltimore, I think, is like this interesting 
kind of neighborhood investment in a way that's really trying to stabilize neighborhoods yeah. and not have a have an outward push. It's Baltimore's been kind of a national leader on this, I see. It has been, but you know what's interesting is that in the case of Baltimore, uh, there's there's two dynamics, which ironically, Matt, it's it's two of the things that have been maybe the triggers of the greatest frustrations for me and for many about Baltimore are actually the things that ironically are actually helping it during the COVID-19 issue. Hmm. Um, one is the fact that there is such a lack of fundamental public transportation in the city of Baltimore, a massive issue in every single condition and circumstance for people to be able to move from where they live to where they can work in uh, COVID actually becomes a, a good thing because it means less public transport, less, less chance of spread. Um, but a massive issue that the city has to contend with. The second piece is the housing piece, right? Where, where density is arguably one of the most dangerous things to have to deal with when it comes to controlling a spread that you see there. And because of the population loss that you've seen in places, whether it be Baltimore or Milwaukee or St. Louis or Cleveland or Detroit, the density becomes less of, less of the issue. Uh, and gentrification, because that takes on a different tone, right? Yeah. Because oftentimes it's not about coming in and replacing. It's, uh, you know, when you're looking at the gentrification issue in a place like a, a, a Baltimore or in East St. Louis, it's about going into places that have actually now become vacant. Right. Uh, and so it creates a, 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 an interesting dynamic to that larger conversation about gentrification as well. I think that, you know, there's, there's one, there's another way to think about gentrification uh, that's not about the neighborhood, it's, it's about the city. Yeah. And I think that that, that kind of gentrification it is incredibly concerning and it, and it takes a different kind of policy level, right? So, so I lived in Boston for several years. Boston has one source of, of revenue, it's property taxes. To get the rate of property taxes raised, you have to get the, the state um, legislature to approve it. So it's, it's really politically difficult. Literally half the city is exempt from paying property taxes because it's a university or hospital or nonprofit. So you're the mayor of Boston and you got to fix your roads and pay your teachers. What do you do? You have this incredible incentive to gentrify your city. And, you know, and that kind of, that kind of gentrification, right, is directly tied to homelessness and displacement. Absolutely. And when, when you go to, like, Washington, D.C., and you ask your cab driver, where do you live, they don't say the U Street Corridor, right? They often say another state, right? Yeah. They say PG County, they say Maryland, they say Virginia. Yeah. And that's, that's the kind of thing that, that citywide gentrification that really is uh, critical. Mm -hmm. I want, to, I want to combine two questions here, two good questions. Uh, one is, should there be a universal right to housing? And what long-term policies do we need to reduce homelessness in New York City? I, I think there should be a universal right to housing. And the reason is simple, which is without it, everything else falls apart. And we've affirmed provision in old age, access to 12 years of education, food, to be rights in this country, and uh, why? Because those things are fundamental to human flourishing vitality. But show me an argument that says housing isn't fundamental to human, of course it is. Uh, housing should be a right because we all need it. So how do we like, so that's kind of talk, right? That's a bunch of talk, like how do we actually take that and turn it into a policy that's feasible? And, um, and so that, the answer that the book comes down on is you take a program that, that we already have, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, that works pretty darn well, and you expand it to everyone who could benefit from it. Only about one, less than one in six now, families that qualify for any kind of affordable housing program benefit from it. So we change that. And we, uh, so if you qualify for this program, you'd benefit from it. And you would take this ticket, and pay not 70, 80% of your income to housing, you'd pay 30% and the voucher would cover the rest. That'd be a game changer. How do we pay for that? Well, it just so happens to be that America has this weird thing called the mortgage interest deduction and the money we spend on that and other homeowner tax subsidies are far outpaced direct housing assistance to the needy. So like we already have a universal housing program actually, like we, an entitlement program. It's just not for poor people. Mm -hmm. 
And so it would be to take that program, do some sensible modifications, and make sure the spending goes to the purpose of low income housing. Mm -hmm. The question on New York City is a question I put to the people in New York City in a way. You know, they know about their city a lot, a lot more than I do. Um, you know, New York City has invested seriously in public housing. I think one in five public housing units in the country is in New York City. Um, and so the level of investment in, in stable housing in New York City has been significant, and it's clearly still not, not enough. Yeah. What you have seen, though, in the city in the last few years is you've seen, like, an incredibly inspired and inspiring tenant movement. Mm -hmm. You know, you have seen New York win the right to counsel in, in housing court, something now that Philly is doing and Newark is doing and San Francisco falls to. You guys relied on the hill at that. Evictions have been down 40% since 2013, yeah. you know, when that started, when that uh, group started organizing, when CASA started organizing. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are a lot of amazing things going on on the ground in New York right now. This, um, uh, this next question actually, in, I, I think in many ways ties to that. Uh, and they write, uh, in Evicted, uh, you write that no one thought the poor more undeserving than themselves. Uh, how can we remedy the psychological damage of evictions and poverty? I think that great line. When, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a powerful question, and um, I remember sitting with Arlene when she read the the, the book, and she said, um, "You know, I see a lot of my strength in the book, but I see a lot of my mistakes too." Hmm. She was hard on herself, and um, she has and we all have in a way, have been socialized in America to think like that. You know, to think, you know, if I'm on top of the world, I must somehow have earned this and worked my way there. And if I am someone facing eviction, I somehow brought this upon myself. And um, that's, that's a narrative we need to replace, I think. And I think one of the ways that we replace it, one of the ways that, that my field, sociology, replaces it is to take a personal problem and turn it into a political one. That's quoting C. Wright Mills. So, to take a problem that feels personal and, and say, look, you know, Arlene, like literally millions of people are in your shoes every year. You know, I remember um, when my family got foreclosed before it was all the rage. And, um, and, you know, going and helping my parents move and moving into this tiny little rental home and like feeling ashamed, you know, and, and blaming them. And, you know, that stuff gets inside you. I think, you know, the organizers have figured, have confronted this problem uh, too, you know, and one of the oldest uh, organizing groups is, um, is in Boston, uh, City Life Vita Urbana. And they have a ritual, they have a ritual, you know, that's designed to, uh, to combat this. And so you show up to their meetings, this was in the height of the foreclosure crisis. I think this ritual really took hold. You show up to their meetings and they have what's called a sword and the shield approach. So the sword is kind of direct action, community mobilization, and the shield is legal, legal assistance, you know, having a lawyer and that's the combined approach. Hmm. And so if a family is facing foreclosure, they would, they would call them to the front of the room and they, they would, I think they literally had like a physical sword and the shield, you know, and they, people would hold it. And they'd say, will you fight? Will you fight? And you're supposed to say, yes, I will fight. And when you do, the room shouts like, we'll fight with you. Like, this is not about you. You know, this is about the system we're all caught up in. And it's kind of an inspiring thing to, to see and experience. And so I think that that's, that's, one way, that's one way to do it on the ground level. So, so then along those lines, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, I'll, and I'll make this the, the, the last question. For many of the people who are listening here, uh, many of them are young professionals. Many of them are people who are, who are you know, working their, their, their jobs and in their professional lives, but who care deeply about this issue because of the fact that, as you said, this is not just about uh, you know, the people who we know within months. You know, we, we saw actually there's a question here uh, uh, about you know, the fact that they'd read that 28 million people might be facing eviction by September. Uh, but this is about the moral soul of our society and about what we will tolerate, what we will accept. When we think about it this way, 
what can young people do in this moment to be able to address these issues that seem so big and so large and so looming, but they want to get in the fight and they're just trying to figure out how. Right. And so, um, so a very practical answer to that question is after I wrote Evicted, uh, my wife and I developed a small organization and that it's, it has a very humble purpose. It's basically to, to serve as a clearinghouse for housing organizations all around the country putting in work, right? That are fighting eviction, that are, that are combating homelessness, that are preserving affordable housing. So wherever you are in the country, you can go to this website called justshelter.org, just, just shelter. And there's a map and you can find out who's doing this in your own neck of the woods and you can, you can get plugged in hmm. with your own time, your resources that you want. You can learn about what the problem looks like in your own backyard. So I think that's the, that's the practical response. Just shelter.org. So, just shelter.org. Um, I think there's a, but I hear you Wes calling for a moral response, yes. you know, and in a, in a moral conversation. And, I think that we all need to consider um, how our lives are just intertwined and bound up with the lives of the poor. We like to talk about the top 1%, the top 0.001% a lot in the country. Um, th that's fair, that conversation is necessary. I think we also need to talk about the top 50%, the top 80%. You know, a lot of us may be on this call um, to think, think about how our lives aren't just different, but like where our kids go to school, the neighborhoods that we live in, the tax breaks that we benefit from mean that some people have to live in unsafe neighborhoods, do not get certain kind of privileges. And I think that's where the moral conversation needs to go. And that moral conversation gets us to a place of thinking about a sacrifice, sure it's sacrifice, but often at the other end of that sacrifice isn't um, pain, it's joy. It's, well, it's, it's fulfillment. It's feeling like this is the kind of society I want to invest in. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And, um, and I'm going to call my representative and say, I don't want this tax break. You know, or I'm going to take my tax savings that I got from the mortgage deduction. I'm going to provide it to a nonprofit in my community. You know, I think this, I think that this is, where I'd like our conversation to go morally as a nation, yeah. to connect the inequality debate with, with the poverty debate. I, um, I love that and I've loved this conversation because you know, I, I think what's really important and one of the really powerful things about not just your work in Evicted but just your continued work, it's reminding people that all of these decisions and policies are being made in your name. They're being made with your taxpayer dollars. They're being made with a sense that you approve of this. And so it's important for us to be able to engage in these conversations because if you don't, you need to let it be known. Because these decisions are being made essentially with your signature at the bottom of every single document. That signature is your citizenship. That, that, that signature is the thing that is saying that you approve of the decisions that lawmakers are, are backing, the decisions that Congress are making, the decisions that the mayors and governors are, uh, are proclaiming on their citizens. Uh, our ability to be able to engage in this work, our ability to be able to understand the human implications of the decisions that are being made, again, it, it's not just something that's a good to do. It's something that you have to understand and embrace because they are, make, they are being done in your name. And you have to be okay with that. And if you're not, it means you have to be engaged in the fight around these various issues. So I'm incredibly grateful for your time today, Matt, and for your continued energy around these issues. As you know, uh, you know the, the issue of, of housing and, uh, and the issues of, of housing security is one of the main platform areas for Robinhood. Uh, specifically because of the interconnectedness of everything that we are dealing with, and particularly in a place in a city like, like New York, and where it is about, you know, about backing platforms like a Just Fixed, where you can essentially have a way of being able to consolidate complaints 
on, 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 on landlords and, and issues that are not being taken care of. And so we know that if people go to housing courts with complaints as individuals, their chances of success are very low. If you can actually come in and essentially almost like unionize your complaints and be able to put together and show that this is a chronic issue, that there's a much higher probability that that issue will be addressed and that, the, that, uh, that you will have a ruling that will go inside of your favor. Also being able to think about how we are using a policy voice and, and being able to, you know, very earlier on how, how Robin had called for more terms on evictions, more terms on utility shutoffs, particularly when we know that we were about to, we are now entering into and in the very early innings of something that was going to have a catastrophic impact on people. And frankly, again, a catastrophic impact on people that they had zero responsibilities for. So we are, we're, we're thankful for your work and for the partnership that we have in there. We know that this is going to be an issue that we will continue fighting and working in because it's an issue that is not going away. And frankly, it's only going to get, uh, it, it will get bigger uh, unless we take truly assertive action on. And, uh, and for all the people who have dialed in here and all the members of the forest, we are, we're just grateful to have you as part of this team and, uh, and looking forward to find new and creative and aggressive ways of being able to make sure that our names are being represented in the way that we think is appropriate. So thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Matt. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, Wes. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you.